I've been here before Now here I am again Standing at the door Praying you'll let me back in To label me a prodigal Scratching the surface Who I've been known to be Turn me around Pick me up Undo what I've become Bring me back to the place Of forgiveness and grace I need you, need your help I can't do this myself Cause you're the only band that was great always wonderful to hear you and I'm glad everything is working again and Mike thanks for making that happen thank you all for getting your connections back we had a spectacular week here with vacation Bible school but it's always interesting to see how things get put back together again but yay, we we got it we got it welcome I'm pastor Kathleen Stoles and pastor Joe and his family are on vacation a well-deserved vac vacation so we welcome you. I know that many of you have already been traveling, and many of our number are traveling this week. In fact, several of the Vacation Bible School staff said, sayonara, see ya, we're out of here. <laughs> so um, well-deserved break for everyone. But we welcome you this morning, and those who are visiting with us for the first time, we especially welcome you, and we hope that you feel God's presence here among us today. So let's continue to worship. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day. I invite you to stand if you're able. We're going to sing a couple songs together. Ready, guys? with 
song called More Than Amazing. I invite you to sing as you're comfortable. So welcome again. As I said, we had a busy week here. We had close to 100 children, preschoolers and elementary, younger elementary. And then we had about 60 volunteers that helped make that happen. About half of them were youth and half of them were adults. So this was just an amazing, an amazing week. And God was certainly present among us 
If you donated any items to make that an amazing vacation Bible school, those items are now in room 104, and they really need to be picked up today because tomorrow room 104's carpets are going to be shampooed. <laughs> so we would love to have that room cleared out as much as possible. So room 104, which is down past the offices, okay, down that hall, um, you know who you are if you donated things. And we thank you for them, for making that all possible. We have some other opportunities for you to serve. The first one is today at noontime. If you um, are thinking of going to Feed My Sheep in Camden, they will be meeting at the kitchen, the Boker kitchen, at 12 o'clock today. And we would love to have your extra support. If you haven't signed up, I'm sure that John would be happy to have you join him anyway. So, um, and it's children ages nine and older if you have young people with you that you wanted to bring along. So that's an important item. The other two things both have deadlines of Tuesday, August 7th. One is National Night Out. Medford's National Night Out is something that happens, actually it's happening in Medford, but it happens around the country. We have this National Night Out. It's a wonderful time to get to know the members of your community and for the past few years, Medford has had a table there, a little booth there, and we will do that again because it is the best way we know to get out there into the community and talk to people and tell them exactly how wonderful this church is. We'll have a little handout for them. We have water. We have all kinds of things that can help you to start the conversation. This is a way for you to go out there and tell the world about Jesus happening here at Medford United Methodist Church. So if you can do that, um, it's in the evening between 5.30 and 8.30. We close up shop around 8.39, somewhere in there. If you can help us out with that, call the church office and just let them know. You don't have to come for the whole time, but let us know when you can be there, okay? Because we would really love to have your help. And the other thing is that we've got backpack collection happening. And, um, and Colin is... Once again, taking on the mantle of that um, and the outreach committee, the youth will all be putting together backpacks. So the information about backpacks is in, um, all that information is in your bulletin. As I said, both of those dates are August 7th. So that's great. Good. Okay, got all that done. So do we have any children? I saw Elijah and Julius out there somewhere. Do you want to come up and help me with children's time? It's all about vacation Bible school, and I know you were there. I have to say that the volunteers who made that this week possible were just awesome. So many of our volunteers are working as well as doing Vacation Bible School. So there were several people that came to VBS in the morning and then they went to work right from here. Some of them worked overnight and then came here in the morning. Some of them had young babies at home, right? And the baby came and was part of VBS too. And dad who was sleeping at night, or working at night and sleeping during the day, he even pitched in. So volunteers are so important, and that's what the week was all about, right? Vacation Bible School was all about learning how we tell other people about Jesus. Do you remember the special words that we had? So we learned about the disciples being called, right? James and John and Simon Peter and Andrew and what did Jesus say to them? Come and follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. That's right. Come and follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. And the word for the day was finding adventure on the river because when we are out there fishing for people, it's always an adventure. So we want you all to join us on the adventure just like they did. And the second day we had a meal with Mary and Martha. Do you remember that one? And Mary and Martha weren't happy with each other, right? They kind of argued about who was doing the most important job. And Jesus said, the jobs are just different. And no job is better than another. No person is better than another, right? So we found acceptance on the river. 
And then there was the story of the man with the funny name. Do you remember that one? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, right. And was Zacchaeus a nice man or a greedy man? Greedy. He was very greedy until he met Jesus. And then he got filled with joy, right? What did he do? What did he do when he got filled with joy? Do you remember? Instead of taking money, what did he do? He gave it back, right? Yeah. Four and did times as more as he asked. Four times as much money as he had taken, that's right. And we all gave things during the week too, didn't we? What did you give during the week? Do you remember? Some baked beans. Some baked beans. So all kinds of food. One of the things that we do during the year, we do it twice a year, we partner with the food pantry in Trenton at the Turning Point United Methodist Church. So this is one of the boxes, just one of many boxes of food that's going to be going to Turning Point because Zacchaeus found joy and we all find joy when we give. So that was the third day. And then we celebrated the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples. And we still celebrate the Last Supper here, right? What do we call it when we celebrate it here? Do you remember that word? Communion, right? We receive communion. And what are the two things that we... Grape juice and bread. Grape juice and... Grape juice and bread, right? Yes, and that reminds us of Jesus. And then the last day was the Great Commission because we all are charged with going out and making more disciples, right? Jesus gave everybody, all of you and everybody, the great commission to go out and make disciples. So I'm just so happy that you were there and you were good disciple makers. What are some of the things that we do to show our love for Jesus and show how Jesus is really, really powerful? You told us about sharing food with others, right? You make sandwiches and you always keep some food in the car so you can give it to people if you see them. What about you, Julius? How do you show that you care for Jesus and that you love each other? You share, right? Yeah, so important. Well, let's take a moment and would you come over here and put your hands on here? We're going to bless this box of food and it represents all the boxes of food out there. So let's take a moment to pray. Can you pray with me? Okay. Repeat after me. Thank you, God, Thank you, God. for sharing our food with the people in Turning Point so that the hungry may be fed. Help us to be strong disciples out on an adventure sharing the love of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, you can go back to your seats. I know, I know. So thank you, ushers, for remembering to pass the... Um, Pew pads. I, I had it on my list. I just didn't say it. <laughs> and thank you all for signing in. And now we have a question of the week. We will do the scripture, but let's do the question of the week first, okay? We are so thrilled to have Paul Barnett with us today. He is one of your own. You raised him up from vacation Bible school, through Sunday school, through youth group, and now he's with us, um, he's finished his time at Princeton Theological Seminary, and he's going to be sharing with us for the message today. But the question that we thought would be interesting to pose is, have you ever, ever put, ever said something that you shouldn't have said? Maybe you regretted it later, maybe you woke up at one o'clock in the morning saying, ah, how did I ever say that? Now, we're not going to ask you what you said, <laughs> but we would like you to share how did it feel? How does that feel when you do that? Almost, almost every day. Oh, you do it almost every day. <laughs> so what's the feeling that you have, Milt, when you do it every day? I don't sleep at night. Uh, oh, that's not good. If it's really severe, nights. I'm able to do something about it. If not, and I remember it at night, I pray about it, but 
I've often said that my eyes and my mouth get me in most, <laughs> most trouble. <laughs> I think we can, many of us can identify with that feeling. Yes, yes. Are there others who would like to share their feelings about that? I know it's really embarrassing, isn't it? Oh, Colin's got one. Okay. It can be embarrassing. It can keep us up at night. Well, with like when you have um, when you have quick wit, you know, sometimes you say things comes out. Man, we, I'll never forget when we had our conversation. <laughs> oh man, but which you, one of those conversations was it, Colin? <laughs> But you no, know, it's funny because my mom would tell me something when she was counting, right? You know, they're, you joke around, you hang out, and like, you say something. Man, if that didn't bother her for years. Mm, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we say things that, that really just are concerning to us, but then we're also concerned about how much it hurts the other person or how much the other person remembers it. And we don't mean it in a malicious kind of way, but sometimes that's how it's heard. So, okay, we've got one more. Sometimes when you say something in your head, mm. it sounds different than when you <laughs> say it out loud. <laughs> and it comes out sounding either more sarcastic than you meant it to sound, whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be hurtful. Uh, amen to that, amen to that. And sometimes we say things thinking it's a joke, but it can be really hurtful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have a scripture reading. Colleen, thank you very much for that. Good morning. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 28 and 33 through 37. Then they brought to him a demoniac who was blind and mute. And he cured him, so that the one who had been mute could speak and see. All the crowds were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, that this fellow cast out the demons. He knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your own exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons." then the kingdom of God has come to you. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. But the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure, and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. I tell you, on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> I figure I should take a moment to more formally introduce myself. My name is Paul Barnett, a member of this church and a recent graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. The reason I name drop Princeton Seminary is because Medford UMC has done a special thing in my life. It was the church where I began my faith journey, and it was the one to affirm my call to ministry in the UMC. And that is something I am truly thankful for. Thus, when Pastor Joe asked me about two months ago if I'd share a message today, I happily obliged. I was tempted to say no because I think the ink had just dried on my last exam, and I was about to crawl in bed for three months when he asked, but of course I said yes. So anyway, 
Thank you, Medford UMC. I mentioned a few moments ago that I just wrapped up three years of seminary in May. And I want to transport you, if I may, to a moment from this past fall. I had the opportunity to intern at the United Methodist Conference Office in communications. Of all the things they had in this nearly brand new studio, I was drawn to one thing, one piece of equipment, the studio's label maker. Have you ever played with a label maker? One of those little gun looking things where you can type out anything you want, click print, and you get a little sticker. Well, as soon as I found ours, I had to play with it. I really don't understand my fascination with label makers, but if I had to label it, I don't think it's so much that I want to mark things as mine, so much as distinguish things as not someone else's. <laughs> when I found this label maker at my internship, I wanted to put stickers on my laptop. My first instinct, though, wasn't to put my name, my first or last name, or my email, or anything that would distinguish my laptop as, as being mine. I wanted to print quotes from my favorite movies. I think I printed something from the movie Blazing Saddles. I already have a Princeton Seminary sticker on my laptop, so it's as if I wanted to say, yeah, I'm a seminary student, but don't pigeonhole me, right? I'm unique. I watched the show Breaking Bad, right? I love watching Mel Brooks movies. Here I am. These things are a part of me. Don't mislabel the situation. So in an attempt to identify truth about myself and to indicate those truths to others, I find myself playing with label makers. But of course, there's a downside to labeling things. As soon as we choose to label something one and not two, or X and not Y, we begin to collapse reality for those reading the labels. In order to uh, avoid being labeled future priest by society at large, I stick a quote from my favorite movie onto my laptop. But in doing so, I get placed into a number of any other categories, not least of which being hypocritical Christian. Those reading the labels often forget the complexity underlying the circumstance. This is something we're all guilty of. When we see something or read something, our instinct is, instinct is to jump to conclusions, to make a judgment. Yet the human brain betrays us into thinking we've got it figured out. It's now nicely collapsed into good or not good, funny or not funny, friend or not friend, but in reality, that's only some of the truth. Yet our mind is made up and we begin to forget, or worse yet, ignore reality. So we are presented with scripture this morning. Someone possessed by a demon is brought to Jesus. This person, presumably a result of their possession, is blind and mute. Without pomp or formality, Jesus heals them. And amazed at this miracle, the crowds begin to wonder, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah we've heard about? We never really imagined the son of David would be characterized by acts of mercy, but heck, it could be him. The crowds begin to try and identify Jesus. They begin to label him. The Pharisees present among the crowds hear this potential label being placed on Jesus and in their wisdom jump to a conclusion that makes absolutely no sense. They cannot deny the power of God, yet they can also not admit that Jesus is acting in the name of God. And so their only apparent recourse is to credit Jesus' acts to the devil. Jesus, casting out demons in the name of a demon. Reading, the, reading this, this wondrous, curious label placed on Jesus by the crowds, the Pharisees placed their own label wildly incorrect. Now Jesus hears this, and I imagine stares at them, bewildered at their conclusion, and then explains why that was just about the dumbest thing they could have said. One, how can demons cast out one another? And two, if I'm casting out demons in the name of the devil... 
then who do you guys work for? Right? You know better. Act like it. How often do we hear something and say, no, that, that can't possibly be right. That doesn't fit the story I've come up with, so it cannot be so. How often do we see our ideological opposite on Facebook or the news and react in disgust because their view of reality is foreign to us? Their view is different from ours. How often do we place an incorrect label on something out of pride or anger or ignorance? Too often. Too often we collapse that which we don't understand or choose not to understand in order to maintain our really neat looking house of cards. Are we really so arrogant as to think we have the answer to every question we're presented with? Think back to all those moments we want to stick a label on a situation or a person. Think back to all those moments we've said something foolish, something we regret after it's left our mouths. In that moment, we're only presenting a smidgen of the truth. So why should we think that if we're reading a label of some sort, we've got it figured out? The answer is yes, we are so arrogant as to think we have the answers. We're humans. We're limited. We can't know everything. We have to make decisions. We have to make judgments, most of the time without seeing the whole picture. This is not to claim there is no truth or that we can't glimpse what the truth is. In fact, the end of our scripture today points us to the opposite to the other direction, right? There is such thing as true and false and good and bad. And even more than that, that good and bad we absorb into our hearts produces fruit. Make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. We've already heard what it takes to bear bad fruit, right? Play the Pharisees from the passage. Make snap judgments. Ignore what's really happening. Put the wrong label on something. This is what followers of Christ are to avoid, for our words, in the end, will be our condemnation. But what do we need to do to bear good fruit? As I said earlier, we're humans, right? We make mistakes. We mislabel things. So what can we do? I believe this truth of how limited we are, a reality that our passage itself points to, calls Christians to three things, three attitudes. The first, an attitude of curiosity. We are to learn as much as possible. We are to learn as much as we can about everything we can in order to glimpse the biggest reality that we can. If you don't like something, figure out why. If you disagree with something, figure out exactly what you disagree with. There's a label that gets thrown around a lot nowadays when we're talking about news. I think you know what it is. Fake news, exactly. Sometimes what you really hear is false, but other times, and I'll say most of the time, the fake news you hear is actually just a part of the picture that you're not familiar with. Take some time to consider other perspectives. So attitude number one was curiosity. The second attitude the scripture points to, an attitude of humility. When we don't know, we are to be humble. In the presence of things we don't understand, be curious, not judgmental. What's the number one question out of a young person's mouth? Why? Right? I'm not sure people lose this attitude. I'm not sure when people lose this attitude. But that's the question that should be most important when there's something we don't understand. Don't mislabel things. Ask why. In the third attitude, our passage points us to an attitude of forgiveness. If we are to live with each other as true neighbors, live with an attitude of forgiveness. Our neighbors make mistakes, just like we do. Misunderstandings happen all the time. Wrong labels get put on things all the time. So forgiveness must happen all the time, for both your neighbor and for yourself. An attitude of curiosity, an attitude of humility, 
and an attitude of forgiveness. I believe if we live with these three attitudes, we can, can and will begin to bear good fruit. We will make mistakes, of course. We will say things we still regret. But at least we can begin to read labels for what they truly are, just labels. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul. So curiosity and humility, forgiveness, those are powerful things for us all to ponder. We're going to have some music now, and we're going to invite our um, ushers to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. So let's take a moment, listen to the music, center ourselves.
time of our lives here at Vacation Bible School this week, there were also some challenges that were going on among our friends and families. So this morning we have some prayer shawls that we would like to dedicate. Um, the brother of Chris Saratella and son of Ida Mae Holt, John, passed away. So one of these shawls is for him. Milt's sister Susan has been battling cancer and she and her husband Larry really need a prayer shawl of hope. So one will be for, for them. And then yesterday, hope I can get through this. Janet Scheffler calls and it was her birthday. So I said, Happy birthday, Janet, because her caller ID name showed up on my phone. How you doing? And she said, well, not so good. So Janet is fine. She celebrated her birthday with Robert, but she also celebrated her with her mom, who's in the hospital. Um, her mom went to the hospital on Thursday and was having trouble breathing, and they've determined that she needs a heart valve replacement. So... So one of these prayer shawls is for Kay. And so let's just take a moment as we dedicate these prayer shawls. And if, if you'll just lift your hands towards these shawls and we, as we pray together, bow your heads and let's pray together. Good and gracious God, we know that you are with us in times of joy as well as in times that challenge our lives. So as we dedicate these prayer shawls today, we pray that they will bring your comfort, your peace, your strength, and all those things that we need and that each of these families needs as they go through these next days. May these prayer shawls wrap them in your love and, and in our prayers so that they know they are not alone that when we pass through the waters, oh God, you are with us. We give you thanks for the prayer shawl ministry that continues to be an outreach of the prayers of this congregation and an outreach of your love. We lift up these people and these shawls in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So now let's take a moment to, to think about those, those prayer concerns that are on our hearts, on your hearts and minds. Take a moment to just close your eyes, get yourself comfortable in your chair. Maybe put your hands on your knees, palms raised to receive the Holy Spirit into your life. as we offer up these prayers. Loving God, we, we have shared some of those concerns that are on the hearts and minds of our congregation as we offered these prayer shawls and dedicate them to you. But we know there are others among our congregation who are hurting. We pray for Janice Bailey on the passing of her husband, Bob. We pray for the family who has lost their young son, Jackson. We continue to pray for Charlotte Garrison who who continues to be facing health challenges and has moved now to yet another care facility. We pray that she might receive the care that she needs and become once again the healthy person that you have created her to be. We know that the joy of your spirit 
in Charlotte's life and in the life of all of us gathered here today and all of those who are listening this day and all of those who believe in you, that joy of spirit keeps us going. It brings us hope, gives us the courage that we need when times are so difficult. In those words that we learned at VBS, we know that you've invited us into an adventure. We know that you remind us to accept one another rather than label others who are different. Because all are unique and have gifts that you've given us. So we pray that those gifts might be used to bring joy not just to ourselves, but joy to the whole world. And as we go out into the world as your disciples, we, we pray that we might just remember that it takes only a few minutes for us to share the good news with others. And one by one, you have asked us as disciples to share that good news and spread the peace and the love of God. And if we each do that, one person, one day at a time, we can, in fact, change this world. Oh, God, you've told us. You've showed us. You've shown us through your son, Jesus, how we can change this world. Inspire us. Heal us. And bring us hope. In the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, one more song. One more. Amen. Well, we serve an everlasting and faithful God. I invite you to stand with us. We're going to close in singing.
do need to remove the chairs today. So if you can stack them and push them against the walls, that's great. Do you know that during Vacation Bible School, we actually got all the chairs in the closets? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> but I'm not asking you to do that. Just stack them and put them against the wall for the cheerleaders this week. That would be great. Thank you. And now as you go from this place, go with the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And may it rest upon you and upon all of God's children. Until we meet again, amen.